I have to admit, I'm a bit surprised at how many people have heard out on such a pretty day. And I'm not much of a, much of a speaker, so I'm quite intimidated. So you have to kind of be nice to me. And, uh, for, uh, the title of today's talk is uh, Why is my heart beat too fast, slow, or irregular? And what can be done about it? And all I can say is there must be a lot of funky heartbeats going on <laughs> to show up today. Uh, I've recognized quite a few faces, so uh, there's people, many of you probably already know who I am, but for those who don't know me, um, my name is Jim Mariano. I'm one of the heart doctors at the Heart and Vascular Institute here in Wisconsin. And um, uh, actually, Dr. Milky over there is the fellow who hired me at 28 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, very appreciative to be here and be able to offer my services. Um, when most people think of the heart, uh, they think of a pump, they think of arteries, pipes, valves, what I refer to as plumbing. Uh, not as many people realize that the heart has electricity in it. And the electricity is what actually governs the heartbeat that sets the heat on pace. And many, many uh, uh, of my partners refer to me as the electrician. <laughs> I like the plumbers who deal with the pipes and the valves and the pump. I deal with the electrical system. And uh, again, the electrical system is what governs the heartbeat. And so when things are wrong with the electrical system, you can get into problems with fast heartbeats, slow heartbeats, and regular heartbeats. And someone like myself and my partner, Dr. Zhao, are entrusted with figuring out, well, what's wrong? Why is the heartbeat fast, slow, and regular? And what can be done about it? So uh, that's what we're here to talk about today. It's a pretty big area, and so I kind of meant this to be an overview. And there's going to be a lot of material that many of you probably already know about. And uh, at the end, though, I'd like to be able to be available for questions so that if people have more deep questions that they want to ask, I'd be happy to, to address them here today. Before getting into it too deeply, I'd like to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'd like to do a little bit of an anatomy and physiology uh, lecture for you. I'll try not to bore you too much because I don't want to get too deep, but I think to be on the same page, we have to really know what we're talking about. I did anticipate this big a crowd, so I, I, I apologize in advance. I don't know if you all can see this or where I can stand where people can see it. But this is, this is the heart. And this is bigger than your heart. Uh, this is about the size of a cow heart. But for illustration purposes, uh, this is the heart. And the heart is basically a pump. So I'll talk a little bit about the plumbing first, just for review. These two big pipes here, veins, bring blood into the heart. And these two big pipes here, arteries, carry blood away from the heart. And the heart's job is to just pump and circulate the blood. If you open up the heart, and I apologize that you can't see this from the back, but if you open up the heart, you see there are four chambers or spaces in the heart. The two upper chambers are called the atria, and the two lower chambers are called the ventricles. Now inside the heart, there are four valves. The valves uh, open and close to make sure blood going through those four chambers moves in only one direction. On the surface of the heart are these red pipes called the coronary arteries. Every time the heart pumps blood out to nourish the rest of the body, some of that blood gets siphoned back to itself to nourish itself. Blockages in these red pipes are what cause heart attacks. If you have a blockage, for example, in this red pipe here in front, preventing the blood from getting any further than right there, then all that muscle downstream wouldn't get fed, and that unfed muscle would die, and that dead muscle would no longer squeeze, so the overall strength of the heart would be reduced. We're not here to talk about the plumbing, but you need to talk about the plumbing a little bit before you talk about the electrical system. The electrical system is a little bit harder to understand because you can't see electricity. You can see valves and you can see pipes. Electricity is invisible to the eye. But there is electricity in the heart, and 
there's actually a specialized collection of cells up here in the right upper chamber, and that collection of cells is called the sinus node, and it makes a small current. And that current, once it's made, it gets carried through the heart from top to bottom through what we call the conduction system. And as that current goes through the heart, it stimulates the muscle to squeeze. Because the current starts in the upper two chambers, the atria, the atria squeezes first, the ventricles squeeze second. And that works out real well because the job of the atrium is to prime the pump, and the ventricles pump all the blood out. If you look at the heart in cross section, something like that. You have the two lower chambers here, the two upper chambers here, and those two circles are two of the four valve rings through which blood flows from top to bottom. Electricity starts in the upper part of the heart in what we call the sinus node. Current goes through the upper part, down the middle, we call that the AV node. And the special cells that carry the current into the ventricles are called the bundle branches. Now these two valve rings through which blood flows from top to bottom are electrically insulated. They don't conduct electricity. So current can only get from top to bottom across this narrow channel. <coughs> so uh, that's, the, that's the electrical conduction system in a in a nutshell. So to cut to the chase then, why is my heartbeat too fast, too slow, or irregular? You have to keep this in mind because this will, this will give you, you know, an understanding of why these things are happening. <coughs> Let's start with why is my heart too slow? That's a little bit easier to talk about. Well, the electricity normally starts up here in the sinus node. And the sinus node is actually influenced by a lot of things in the body, in the blood. There are nerves that innervate the sinus node. So sometimes the heart rate is too slow because of these extrinsic factors, these factors outside of the heart that might slow the heart down. A real common cause of a slow heartbeat is medication. Um, I was on a medication called metoprolol. It's for blood pressure. And one of its side effects is it slows the heart down. Medicines, medicines like metoprolol can actually affect the sinus node to slow the heart rate. Now, if your heart is too slow because of a medication, the treatment isn't to fix the heart, the treatment might be to adjust the medication. So these, that's an example of what we call extrinsic factors, things outside the heart that influence the heartbeat. Um, now, one of the more common causes of, of uh, a slow heartbeat though, unrelated to medicine or any extrinsic factors is something called sinus node dysfunction. That's where the sinus node, um, how shall I put it, gets weak and peters out, very commonly associated with getting older. <laughs> the, the sinus node normally slows as we age and so it's a, it's a fact of nature that our hearts are going to slow as we get older. Um, now, a little bit of a slow heartbeat might be okay if you feel perfectly well, but a normal heart rate at rest or average heart rate at rest is in the 60s, 70s, 80s. If your heartbeat is 20 or 30, which is less than half of normal, as you might imagine, that'll slow you down. I didn't know what a fuel pump was on a car until my fuel pump went down. And when the fuel pump went out as I was driving up to Antigo one day, I, I I could only go 20 miles an hour, even though I had the accelerator all the way down. And that's how I imagine a person must feel when the sinus node gets too slow. You can't, get, you, you can't really do much because your, your heart rate is too slow. So sinus node, that's called sinus node dysfunction, we actually also call it sick sinus syndrome, is a real common cause of slow heartbeats and it's often associated with aging. It, it, uh, we'll talk about treatments in a minute, but uh, it's one of the more common co common reasons why people get pacemakers as we get older, because the sinus node just starts to slow. 
Another common cause of slow heartbeats, though, is problems with the current getting not just at the beginning, but as it goes through the heart. Um, there is a condition called heart block where the current gets hung up right here in the AV node. <coughs> And if current gets hung up and doesn't get to the bottom of the heart, you've got trouble. The top part's job is to just help fill the bottom. The bottom is what pumps all the blood out. So if the, if the electricity get, doesn't get to the bottom to tell the heart to beat, or it gets hung up now and again, the heart's going to be too slow. The way we're made, the AV node is actually made to slow things down a little bit. You don't want the top and the bottom of the heart beating at the same time. If current went through the heart real fast, the top and the bottom would practically be together. So when, when the heart, the heart is actually designed to have a little bit of a delay in that AV node so the top and the bottom can work in proper fashion. But in some people, the AV node acts up such that it slows things down way too much or may not let all the beats through. And so instead of the heart going loved up loved up, loved up, you might have a situation where the top heart beats loved up, loved, loved up, loved every other beat or every, some, some pattern doesn't get through. And again, that would slow the heart down. And again, same analogy of the sinus node being slow. If the heart gets too slow, you're only going to go 20 miles an hour, even if you want to go 60 miles an hour. Um, Electrical problems can happen anywhere along the length to slow things down, but the two most common areas are the sinus node and the AV node. So, as far as slow heartbeats, what, what can be done about it? Well, if the problem is something outside the heart slowing things down, affecting the sinus node, as in my case with the medication, the treatment is to adjust the medication so the heart rate heart doesn't get too slow. There are other things which you won't get into, but there are many influences on the heart that can affect the heart. So the primary care doctor can, is often very much involved in the evaluation and treatment because they know more about these external features, whereas an electrician like me kind of focuses just on the heart. If the problem is related to the sinus node or the AV node or anything anywhere along the line with the electricity getting hung up, there really are no good pills to fix a slow heartbeat. If the heartbeat is too slow and you can't find something you can take away to make it better, the treatment for that is a pacemaker. A pacemaker is a, a device that uh, can sense the heartbeat and if the heart's too slow, it sends electricity to the heart to pick up the pace. I'm gonna pass around a, a, a sample of what a pacemaker looks like. It's just a model. It won't shock you, don't worry. <laughs> so pacemaker is a little device. that sits under the collarbone, under the skin and fat, with a couple of wires that go into a vein and drain into the heart. One wire usually in the upper part, one wire usually in the lower part of the heart. And Basically, if the sinus node doesn't work, the pacemaker will send electricity here to the sinus node to, pick, to create a current, which then get carried through the heart. And if for some reason it doesn't get through the AV node, the pacemaker will send current down to the bottom part of the heart to face the bottom part. So the top and the bottom will still be normal. Basically, restores uh, the normal pace and beat of the heart. If you want to hear about how we put in pacers, we can talk about that later. But just be this for this part, just realize that the pacemaker's job is to keep the heart from going too slow. That's what the pacemaker does. It doesn't, for the most part, it doesn't do other things. A lot of people assume that a pacemaker will pretty much fix everything electrical, but it really doesn't. It just pretty much takes care of slow heartbeats. <clears throat> that pretty clear to everyone? Or does anyone have any questions about the slow heartbeats or treatment for slow heartbeats? before we go on to fast heartbeats. It's smart. The, 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 the pacemaker is essentially a computer. It, can, it not only sends electricity, it actually senses electricity. 
So if it doesn't sense any electricity from the sinus node at the program rate, it'll say, hmm, a beep hasn't come. I'm going to send a signal through to, to pace the heart. So it acts on demand. If you don't need it, it doesn't kick in. We do set it. It's, it's programmable, like a computer. And once you have it in, you can actually program things with the computer at a distance. Like it's sitting in your program. Yes. And you set the rate. And there are, there are normal rates that we usually use. And you can adjust it, because you might set it one way, and the person might say, well, Dr. Mariano, I just can't, uh, my heart rate just doesn't seem to respond to the work at, in my home. Can you change it? We can adjust it. Well, in the, in the case of, in, in the cases, of, in some cases, people die. If, if, the, if the current, if there's something called the heart block, where all of a sudden all the current just stops here in the middle and nothing get, goes through, and uh, very often people would would just die. Uh, might start fainting first because it usually doesn't just happen catastrophically. Usually it, it, it happens progressively, so people might start fainting and then one day just faint and not wake up. Or in the case of sinus node dysfunction, usually people don't die from that, but they may just slow down, get real slow and, and, uh, and maybe start fainting. And of course, if the heart rate gets way too slow, all other organs of the body start to fail. Your kidneys and and so forth, and so people would die. When do you make the decision to have a combination of case making and That's a good question. We'll save that for a little bit later because the defibrillator kind of, you're talking about a device that works on both fast and slow. So we'll talk about just the slow first. So next thing I'd like to talk about is fast, fast heartbeats. Um, the fast heartbeats are a little bit trickier to talk about, more complicated. Again, like slow heartbeats, it's possible that extrinsic factors, things outside of the heart, in the blood and in the nerves can stir the heart up. Again, to use my own family's experience, my daughter had a very fast heartbeat. And uh, of course, there's concern when you're child has a very fast heartbeat and it turned out though she had nothing wrong with her electrical system uh, again medication she was on medication for asthma and the asthma medication was making the heart go too fast and so by taking that medication away or adjusting it that squared it away so extrinsic factors can can make the heart go too fast just like sometimes it can make the heart go too slow but outside of that within the heart there are two ways that the heart can go too fast. Um, the most common, the co most common reason why the heart goes too fast is due to uh, uh, something called uh, reentry. A uh, reentry is a short circuit in the heart. I don't know how many of you are electrically inclined, but the heart, uh, just like uh, mechanical things, you can get short circuits in the electrical system. A short circuit is a, an electrical loop where the current, instead of going through the heart from top to bottom, finds itself spinning in a circle. And these loops can occur anywhere along, along the line. So I took care of a, a patient a few weeks ago where there was a little short circuit right here, a little piece of muscle bridging the annulus. Remember I told you that those the two valve rings are electrically insulated. They don't conduct electricity, so current can only get from top to bottom across this middle channel. But this person had an extra little piece of muscle bridging this circle, so electricity could come down a second way. And that creates a, a potential for a reentrant circuit. Current may go down this way, it may go down this way, but it's possible for the current to come down and start spinning in a circle. And that can make the current go very, the heart go very fast. You can actually get short circuits anywhere along the length. Some people have short circuits up here, little, a little electrical loop, or a little electrical loop down there making the heart race. If the electrical loop is in the upper part of the heart, the upper part goes real fast if the electrical loops in the bottom part, the bottom part goes too fast. And 
Um, in, in some cases, the problem is not life-threatening, but in some cases, it can be very life-threatening. The heart goes way too fast. The heart can actually get to the point where it just said it, 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 it starts to quiver, and that's called fibrillation. And when the, if the bottom part of the heart were to start quivering and stop beating, understandably, you've got bad troubles. The other way the heart can race is a little bit different. It's called increased automaticity. And that's a situation where a cell either in the upper or lower part of the heart takes over the heartbeat. Any cell of the heart can actually make a current. Usually, though, if they behave themselves, all the cells wait for the signal from the sinus node to fire. But some patients, either because of medical issues or some, something wrong with the heart, cells outside of the sinus node can actually take over the heartbeat. And uh, again, if, Kate, if, it, if it starts in the upper part, the upper part starts to race. If it starts in the bottom part, the bottom part starts to race. And in both cases can be very dangerous if the heart gets too fast, it can get to the point where the heart says enough's enough and it can start quivering. And a quivering heartbeat, as you might imagine, is not a good thing that not a good thing to have. So these two situations are the two main situations by which the heart can race. Now fixing, fixing a fast heart rhythm is a little more complicated than slow heartbeats, but we have many more things we can do for a fast heartbeat. There are lots and lots of medications that are designed to target irritable cells to quiet them down so they don't race. There are lots of medicines that can also be used to keep the heart from spinning in a circle by affecting electrical properties of the muscles so it maybe, maybe it just spins a couple of times and then quits. So medications can be used for fast heartbeats. Now, more commonly though nowadays, is to try to get rid of the abnormal spot. So instead of just trying to treat things and put a Band-Aid on it, we can now get rid of the bad spot, get rid of it, or break the circle. If you get rid of the bad spot or break the circle, the heart not only won't race, it can't race. So you're essentially cured. And that procedure is called ablation. Many of you have probably heard of the procedure called an ablation. An ablation is a procedure where we go up into the heart with wires and we actually, uh, well let me back up a little bit. We first go up into the heart with wires to actually figure out what's wrong. Because when the heart races, when the heart's racing, you, you may not be able to tell what's going on just by feeling the pulse or looking at the EKG. You actually have to determine what's going on. And an electrical test called an electrophysiology study allows us to figure that out. We can actually introduce wires through your veins usually in the groin and sometimes in the neck, and thread these wires up into the heart. And these wires have multiple electrodes. I'll pass around an example of what these electrodes look like. So it's a, a wire that actually goes up the vein all the way into the heart, and there are these platinum electrodes. And just like an electrician checking a TV or radio, we can actually measure the electricity with a computer and can map out the electricity. We can actually make a map, an electrical map, of what's going on and can determine whether there's increased automaticity or irritability or a short circuit causing the heart to race. Um, so this is called a catheter, you can pass that around. And you know, some of these wires are quite sophisticated, you can actually steer them. Here's an example of a wire that we put up into the heart through the veins. Believe it or not, all under local anesthesia, people are awake for this. And you can actually move these wires around you can see, when you pass it around, you'll be able to see these electrodes. You can move things around inside the heart to kind of pinpoint uh, exactly where the problem is. And with these wires in the heart, if you determine, for example, that you have a short circuit and you take one of those wires and touch that abnormal connection, you can actually cauterize, either heat and cook, burn, or freeze the abnormal spot, and if you get rid of it, boom, it's, it's gone, it's fixed. In the case of an irritable spot, just like burning away a wart or a mole, you can go up into the heart, find the, that wart in there, that crazy wart, and burn it away, and if you get rid of it, again, you're actually cured. It sounds really simple, I wish, I, I wish it worked like that for everybody, but unfortunately, in some people, the irritable spot, or spots, 
or the, ear, or the abnormal circle might be too close to something delicate, <coughs> or it might be located in a place of the heart that you can't reach, you just can't get to it. And if it's in an area that's too delicate, or if it's an area that um, you can't reach, you obviously can't get rid of it. And very often you don't know that ahead of time, so you have to do that electrical test to figure that out. Some people also, and we'll talk, I'm sure some of you will ask about atrial fib and some of these other fast rhythms. Some rhythms are complicated because it's not just one spot or one circle. There might be multiple spots, multiple circles. And if you, if you leave any of those spots behind, it's not cured. So I wish I could say everybody with fast heartbeats could be cured. It's not true. But there is that potential, if you have a fast rhythm, that may be able to be tackled with this procedure called an ablation. Some rhythms, if you get rid of it, some rhythms will never come back. So for example, the <coughs> a couple weeks ago that had we call this an accessory pathway, that will never come back. But some rhythms do come back, just like words can come back on a, you know, you burn off a word over here, you can develop a word over there. Some can come back. For people that are born, for example, with an, they're actually born with a little piece of muscle there, and you get rid of that extra muscle, that never comes back. But people that develop irritable spots as they get older, like again, like moles and stuff, new ones can grow. The one you burn may never come back, but a new one can show up somewhere else. Ah. Don't like to hear that. Yeah, some do come back for sure. Now, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is irregular heartbeats. I have an irregular heartbeat that not too fast, not too slow, but kind of erratic. Um, I wish everyone's heart was like a Swiss watch, perfectly steady and regular, but my, mine certainly isn't. And One of the more, well, the, great, the reason many heartbeats are erratic, not too fast or too slow, but erratic, is due to irritable cells outside of the sinus node that don't take over the heartbeat. They don't really take it over, but they mess up the rhythm. So in my case, I have an irritable cell in the bottom part of the heart that doesn't make the heart race, but it just throws off a beat every once in a while, just to irritate. And Normally, the heartbeat is nice and steady. But if you have an irritable cell that throws off a beat once in a while, I'll put it in here, it throws in a beat. The way we're made, this beat doesn't come in. Because this one came in. And the heart waits for the next normal beat to come in. So from the early beat to the next normal beat, there's more, there's a bigger gap in time. And during that time, the heart's filling with blood. So when this beat comes in, it's a particularly hard beat because you've got all that time for the heart to fill. In the case of heartbeats that start down here, like I have, these are called PVCs, premature ventricular complexes. Some people have the premature beats up here, called PACs, premature atrial complexes. Now, everybody has some, because nobody's heartbeat is perfect. There's always a little bit of irritability in just about everyone's heart. But in most people, they might have one once in a while, so they don't even notice it. When you have a lot of them, I think, I, I don't know how many thousand I had when I did my Holter monitor, and I have. You can feel them because they're happening more frequently. Now, in the case of PACs and PVCs, they're not, for the most part, not life threatening. So if you can live with it, oftentimes it's best to just live with it. But if you just can't live with it because it's bugging you too much, these can be tackled with medicine, medicine, or with ablation. Ablation is something that you can apply to PACs and PVCs. We generally don't like to do ablation in these, 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 with these problems because, as you were talking about earlier about recurrences, oftentimes, even if you get rid of this bad spot, another spot often shows up. So usually for 
these ir irregular beats like this, we usually either do nothing. I try to talk people out of taking anything and living with it, or maybe a little, med little bit of medication. So I think that covers slow heartbeats, fast heartbeats, irregular heartbeats. I think we got through um, what causes them and a little bit about what can be done about them. Again, I didn't expect this many people here. I kind of expected just a small group of people, so I apologize that you couldn't see things in the back. I wanted to make sure I spent most of the time, though, answering questions, because my experience has been, having been a student for many years, I've gone to school for many years, sitting in a lecture is, can be pretty boring. But if you have a specific question that you want kind of addressed, uh, related to you, a family member, a friend, that usually sticks with people. So I want to spend most of the time answering questions. Oh, before I get to you, I, I want to, I, I, she got a question about the defibrillator. I should get to that one. So a defibrillator is a special pacemaker. And I've got a sample of one. This is what it, I'll pass it around. This is a defibrillator. So it kind of looks like the pacemaker, but it's bigger. So the defibrillator is a special pacemaker that um, is used for life-threatening rhythm problems. I mentioned earlier how some people have rhythm problems where there's a risk of the heart just stopping and quivering like a bag of worms. That would be fatal. Um, if that were to happen, a person would collapse. Someone would call 911. The paramedics would come with the paddles. They come quickly enough and jolt the heart, the person can be brought back to life. Now the kicker is that most cardiac arrests don't happen where there's someone around or a paramedic gets there quickly enough. And most people that have a cardiac arrest don't make it. So there was a really smart guy named Dr. Morawski out east who figured, well, why don't I invent something that I could implant like a pacemaker that could shock the heart. Uh, and he developed one. Back then he called it the AID, the Automatic Implanted Defibrillator. And it was, uh, it was in the late 70s and early 80s. Interesting story. Uh, no one believed it. None of the heart doctors really believed it. Uh, I, I, I wasn't there. I graduated medical school in 85, so it already been, but, 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 uh, but I understand that he went to medical meetings and he showed his invention and people thought it was crazy, that it was not possible. Uh, there was a famous um, video that he showed of a, a dog, uh, not to offend anybody, about the you know, pet, pet lovers about this, but he actually implanted a, one of these devices in the dog and he had a, a, a method of actually putting a dog into cardiac arrest. And so he showed this video where the dog went into cardiac arrest, collapsed, and it's just laying there, and all of a sudden it just jerked, got up, and walked off the stage. And, and people, you know, called it a hoax. Now, it really wasn't. And uh, almost single-handedly, he helped develop the, the automatic defibrillator, and it, it actually became FDA approved in 1985. And uh, that defibrillator, that implanted defibrillator, has saved countless lives since then. It's essentially a device that does the exact same thing the paramedics do, or a nurse or a doctor do with the paddles, except it's all done with this little unit. That little unit sits under, under the skin and fat, just like a pacemaker, with a wire that's inserted into the vein and into the heart. Looks something like, you know, this is this is an old version. I'll show I'll pass this around. The wire sits inside the heart in the vein and plugged into the device. Instead of just a wire that paces the heart, there's actually when, when you pass around you see a coil. There's a, a metal coil here that actually sits inside the ventricle of the heart. And this is hooked up to the device. If you go into cardiac arrest, the device will, will see that the heart's quivering with the electricity acting crazily. will charge a capacitor in that unit. There's a battery that charges the capacitor. The capacitor will then discharge, delivering electricity to the heart. 
getting the heart back into rhythm. So, uh, boy, that the blue has been a, a, a very, very important invention and saved many, many lives. Um, only about, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 percent of people who have a cardiac arrest out in the community that have a, will, will survive. With a defibrillator in you, if you have a cardiac arrest, it, it approaches 100 percent bringing you back. It works so quickly. It takes about one second for it to tell if there's something wrong. It takes about five to ten seconds to charge the capacitor and deliver the shock. So by the time someone calls 911, the person's already getting up off the floor. Um, there was an interesting thing that happened once in downtown Appleton. I implanted a defibrillator in a patient. True, this is a true story. It's really remarkable. He was walking in, uh, on College Avenue, and he had a cardiac arrest. He collapsed. So uh, someone called, said, asked to call 911, and someone went to start CPR, and uh, no pulse, wasn't breathing. He gave a little jerk. He sat up, and people started going, what's going on? And he wanted to just walk away. He didn't really want to go to the hospital or have anyone make a fuss. But uh, he, uh, truly remarkable story. And, and people were just shocked. It was almost like he had risen from the yeah. and, and, and essentially, And essentially, he had. So the defibrillator basically does that. Now, a pacemaker keeps the heart from going too slow. The defibrillator keeps the heart from going, I guess you'd say, too fast. Quivering is way too fast. Every defibrillator that you buy now has a pacemaker in it. In the old days, back when I graduated medical school in 85, uh, back then it was called AID. They changed the name because AIDS came out in 1985. <laughs> so, so, so now we call it an ICD, implanted cardiovascular. And back then, the AI, the AID um, uh, did not have a, pa a regular pacemaker in it. It just had the defibrillator, and it could only treat one thing. You could only program it to do one thing. The modern defibrillators now have pacemakers in it, so just in case your heart goes slow, it's in there. And you can program it to treat many different fast rhythms. I, 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 I use the term really bad and just a little bad rhythm. You can kind of program different levels. So there's some people who have bad rhythms, but they don't quite pass out, or you may not want to shock them right away. You might want to try to tickle the heart a little bit to get them back in rhythm. You can actually program that like a computer. I don't know. We can. Yeah, the doctor, the doctor does the program. We don't want the patient to do the <laughs> So I have a friend that had done and he related that. You know, she's had it quite a while, but she came in one day to see me and she said it went off and boy is that shot. But he was he's fine. Yeah. They're, they're, the the defibrillator uh, shock is quite painful. I have, have had the distinction of getting shocked. I think it's six, I'm up to six times now. I actually did research on this when I was a student and I, like crazy distracted students, I accidentally had the, I don't have one in me, but I, I have the shock go through me and you don't want to have that happen too often. I, I think it hurts a lot. Some of my patients say it's like touching an electric fence. Mm -hmm. Some people tell me it's like getting kinked in the chest or getting hit in the mm -hmm. chest by a two by four. I, I just thought it hurt a lot. Yeah. <laughs> the one good thing is it's very quick, and if it saves your life, it, it might be worth a few seconds of pain. Yeah. What can be very frustrating, though, is some people get inappropriate shocks, where it shocks them, the heart is racing. It's not a life-threatening rhythm, but the machine isn't sure. It says, my, his heart's racing. Is it really bad, or is it fine? If it's fine, it won't shock you, it'll leave you alone. If it's really bad, it'll shock you. If it's not sure, it'll shock you. Because it doesn't want to take any chances. And so some people get what are called inappropriate shocks. And it's quite disconcerting, you know, that you have, you know, you're sitting there having dinner and getting shocked. The new, the, new, the new devices, though, are, again, so programmable, we can actually program features to minimize that risk. And it's a lot less of a problem now than it was 20 years ago. <clears throat> so how often do you be 
Typical, well, a pacemaker battery, how long the battery lasts depends on how much you use it. In the case of a pacemaker, there's some people who parts are slow all the time, so the pacemaker is working all the time. Other people whose hearts are slow just once in a while, where it kicks in just once in a while. Same with the defibrillator. There's some people that have a defibrillator that have never got a shock year after year. On the other hand, there are other people who have had multiple shocks every year. They have bad rhythms every year. The defibrillator doesn't prevent the bad rhythm, it treats it once it happens. If you have a very irritable heart, there are some people that have shocks somewhat frequently. The battery won't last quite as long. For pacemakers nowadays, their battery typically lasts eight to 10 years. For a defibrillator battery, um, I think it's probably closer to six to eight years for a typical average patient. For people who have lots of bad rhythms, where they're, we don't let them get shocked every week. If someone's having a really irritable heart, we put them on medicine. Remember I mentioned medicine can be used to quiet the bad rhythms? If someone is getting frequent shocks, and they, for me, if I got more than one or two a year, I, I wouldn't be too happy. For those who have frequent shocks, we put them on drugs. And the drugs decrease the irritability to reduce the likelihood of shock. So you're, you're, talk, you're talking about AFib, right? Yeah. Okay. So AFib. Okay. So Dr. Zhao, my partner, gave a talk on AFib a few weeks ago. I heard there were 200 people here. It was really crowded because AFib is actually the most common irregular heartbeat an electrician sees in the office. I didn't spend too much time today because I know he had, he had talked about it. But AFib is an irregular rhythm that originates in the atrium. Fibrillation, the medical term fibrillation means quivering. So atrial fibrillation means the atrium is quivering. And it, it quivers, again, it quivers for one of two reasons. Either there are irritable cells of the upper part that are firing repetitively, causing a, a very chaotic rhythm, or you can have little, we call them micro reentry, lots of little circles spinning around causing the top part to quiver. When the atrium <coughs> fibrillates, the ventricles don't also fibrillate because the AV node acts like an electrical filter. It filters some of the electricity away. So when the atrium fibrillates, thankfully the ventricles don't also fibrillate because then we wouldn't be talking. <laughs> but when the atrium fibrillates, the ventricles tend to go fast and erratic. Not quivering, but fast and erratic. So your question re relates to what are the different treatments. There are two big treatment strategies for AFib. One is called rate control, and one is called rhythm control. In the case of rate control, you leave the heart in atrial fibrillation, but you give people medicine to modulate or to slow the heartbeat down, to increase the filter, so the bottom part doesn't go too fast. So the top part's still quivering, the bottom part is being irregular, but not too fast or too slow. That's called a rate control strategy. Very often in AFib, not only do you need medicine to slow the heart down, but you need to be on a blood thinner. Normally, blood doesn't clot when it's going through the heart, but when the top part's quivering like that, like a stagnant pond, there's stasis. Blood isn't flowing very well, and clots can form. If a blood clot were to form in the upper part of the heart, fall down, get popped loose, you could have a stroke. So in the rate control strategy, very often people are on medicine to slow the bottom part and a blood thinner to reduce the risk of a clot <coughs> The other big way of taking care of AFib is rhythm control, to try to put the heart in rhythm. And that can be achieved uh, one of two ways, like I talked about with fast rhythms. One is with medicine. You can, you can give medicine that might decrease the irritable spots so they're not fired repetitively, or uh, medicine that might affect the spinning in these circles to keep them from spinning. Those are called antiarrhythmic drugs. Or ablation, you go up into the heart and cauterize the abnormal triggers or create burns in the atrium to keep it keep those circles from spinning to prevent the atrium. Which is better? Well, in my view, normal rhythm is better. But 
getting to normal rhythm isn't always so easy. As if, if, if any of you have AFib, you know it isn't always so easy to get into normal rhythm. The medicines that we use have lots of potential side effects, and ablation doesn't always work. In the case of AFib, it's very complicated because not, AFib is not just one thing. It's a very complicated arrhythmia. It can be, two people can have AFib, and it's due to different mechanisms. In some people, they're irritable cells firing repetitively causing the aphid. In other people, there are little short circuits spinning. You can imagine ablating something like one versus the other is going to be very different. Ablation works really well if you have specific isolated triggers, little, little points that are triggering the aphid. Because if you can burn or either eliminate that circle or burn around that irritable spot to prevent it from corrupting the rest of the apple cart, you might be cured. Those patients have a fairly high cure rate. And so many people with aphid have the other people. <coughs> there are lots of circles spinning or miracle spots. There's something called the AFFIRM trial, which is a, a research project that was done many years ago now comparing rate control versus rhythm control. And the results of that trial suggested that your life expectancy is the same regardless of which strategy you choose. So if you're talking about life expectancy, there shouldn't be any difference. The main reason, though, we try to get people in normal rhythm is very often, even if you control the rate, a lot of people don't feel good. They want to feel better. So at that point, a person has to decide, is it worth taking the risk of the medicine or going through an ablation to feel better? For some people, it's worth the risk and the expense. For other people, my grandma had AFib for 30 years, and she couldn't even tell. So she just lived with the AFib and took a blood thinner warfarin. A little, back then, they used the Joxin. We don't use that so often anymore. And she was on a couple pills, and she lived to 90 and died of something completely unrelated. So it all depends. AFib is a complicated rhythm because it's not two people can have AFib, but it's, it's a little different. So you might have a, you have a friend that's you might have two friends, three friends with AFib, and each one gets a different treatment. And the reason is there's different underlying mechanisms. Um, heart doctors recommend physical activity for heart patients. What's going on when people do physical activity to make their heart problem better? And whether they know they have too much or not enough or just the right amount. What's actually going on inside the heart? Like, because of the exercise? Well, your question's a little complicated because heart problems, there are many kinds of heart problems. So here tonight we're talking about electrical things, and of course there are plumbing problems too. So there are some situations where exercise can be actually, vigorous exercise can actually be maybe a little dangerous, but, it, but for, for the most part, exercise is good because it keeps the heart healthy. Most, most of the studies that are out there show that people who exercise on a regular basis are less likely to have heart attacks and, 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 and have a longer life. Now, electrically, the exercise doesn't really help or hurt the electrical system. So I'm probably the wrong guy to ask because I'm an electrician and not a plumber. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, do, I do know enough about the plumbing to know that exercise is encouraged. When I was a, a medical student uh, on the heart wards, it was just the opposite. We would put people to rest. People had a heart attack, they were put to bed for two weeks. They were pretty much in bed. We'd give them Valium so that they would just sleep. And, and uh, it's completely different now. We, people with heart failure, whose hearts were weak and they were having fluid buildup, oh, you think they can't exercise, you gotta keep them down. That's, it's got full circle. Uh, now, now we try to get people up and move them around because most of the data suggests that, that moving, you don't use it, you lose it. Exercise is a good thing for most, most patients. But you'll have to ask one of my plumbing, plumbing buddies for, for more specific, <laughs> specific answers to that question. Well, what are some of the risks of medication? Like all medications, uh, the medicines that I talk about here have do good things and some, some bad things. Depends on the medicine. So, is there a specific medicine you, you're wondering about, or 
the, 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 the medicines, uh, every medicine has potential side effects. So, and, and they're very different. So some of the medicines I use for rhythm can help the rhythm but can hurt the lungs, or the liver, or the eyes, or the thyroid, or the skin, or the nerves. Some people ask, well, how do you decide which pill to put me on? Well, I talk to the family doctor, I study the chart, I look, if someone's kidneys are weak, I don't want to give them a pill that might hurt the kidneys. If someone has uh, a bad liver, I don't want to give them a pill that might hurt the liver. So you pick the pill based on the side effect profile. So you pick the pill that is going to do a good job and avoid any bad things. So, Antiarrhythmic drugs, the, the drugs that affect the electrical system are particularly scary because one of the risks that's common to many of them is all of them have the potential to make the rhythm much worse. So for example, some of the medicines for AFib, AFib is an irregularity coming from the upper part of the arm. It can turn AFib into VFib, ventricular fibrillation in the bottom part of the river. So that's very bad, right? Because the bottom part of it does all the work pumping the blood out. You get VFib without a defibrillator, you can die. That's a potential risk of any of the electrical pills that we use. Okay? Drugs like amiodarone, sodalone, ticosin, plecanine, apophenone, those are rhythm medicines. All of them carry that, that risk. And one of my jobs is to make sure that doesn't happen. You never eliminate the risk, but you can mitigate the risk, keep it at a minimum. That's why our rhythm patients come in, they get EKG or some kind of evaluation periodically to make sure it's doing all the good things and then the bad things. And that's why some of these pills are started in the hospital. I don't know if any of you are in any of these meds, but some of the meds have to be started in the hospital. And the reason for that is for many of them, the bad, bad, bad things tend to happen in the first couple days. So if you're in the hospital three days, got through the worst thing. Did that answer your question? Sorry? Yeah. Metoprolol? Metoprolol is a really commonly used one. I think I told you earlier, I was on it for a while. Metoprolol is a very, very, very safe one. It's a very safe <coughs> medicine. But yeah, it's not quite as powerful as some of those other ones. So metoprolol is often used when by the way, metoprolol is used for many things. It's used for high blood pressure. It's used in people with congestive heart failure to help them live longer. Um, it's used for fast heartbeats to slow things down. It's used for irregular heartbeats, like mine, to keep it from skipping so much. So it can be used for many, many different things. Whenever I pick up my metoprolol on my pharmacist and say, Doc, here's your blood pressure pill. I won't, well, it wasn't out for my blood pressure. It's not a good skipping, but the most commonly used in the is for blood pressure. So the metropolis is very safe, very safe. It's also not real, real, real powerful. So very often, uh, my plumbing buddies will start people on metropolis. And yes, if that doesn't work, then they'll send them a doctor's hour to me, because we're going to use the more powerful ones. What about, what about the people who are how effective are those? Or how very, do you use them? Very, very effective. Um, I remember when Dr. Milky uh, and the Rotary, I think I had to give a talk one day. I'll tell you this, this is kind of a funny story. Uh, yeah, the Rotary, many years ago, the Rotary, I think I sidetracked. The Rotary, uh, many years ago, actually purchased several of these to put downtown and saved countless of lives since then. It's, it essentially works the same way as any defibrillator. And it just works automatically. It works exactly the same way, actually, as the implanted one. It can sense a bad rhythm, only it's not on the inside, it's all on the outside. Very simple to use. You open it up, it has a couple patches. It tells you where to put them. Yep, a patch goes here, a patch goes here. It push a button, it turns it on. The computer will read the rhythm. It'll say something to the effect, bad rhythm, gonna shock, stand clear. <laughs> and then it gives the shock, and, and it, it, go, it, go, it does things automatically. It doesn't do as many things as the implanted defibrillator, which is much more sophisticated, but it does, it does the work of the paddles, only uses patches. You get the paramedics there, it's not That's right, that's right. That's, that's where it saved many, many lives, because 
And it takes paramedics a little while to get there. And if, the pet, if this doesn't work, then they have their defibrillator and they have other things that they can do to help. That's got, I, I'll tell you just a quick story. It was kind of a funny story. When I first came to Appleton, there was a gentleman that I put a defibrillator in that really wanted me to talk to some of his friends. And uh, I kept putting him off, putting him off. And I finally couldn't put him off any longer. I was just being rude. So he said, Doc, I'll, I'll come pick you up at lunch. you got to eat lunch, so I'll pick you up. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick you up in my Cadillac, and I'll take you up. And so I, I, I reluctantly agreed. And, and uh, he came to pick me up. And in my mind, I envisioned going to Mary's or something, a small restaurant, sitting around with a, a couple of fellas and, and just shooting breeze. He said, you can talk about whatever you want. Well, he picked me up and he, he, he drove me downtown. He drove to the Paper Valley. And I thought, ooh, a fancy meal. And so I'm, I'm walking to Paper Valley. And, but instead of walking to the right where the restaurants were, he started heading to the left, where all the ballrooms are. And I thought, huh, that's kind of strange. So we kept walking, and we, and we, we walked, in and, and we walked by this, this area where I started hearing lots of buzzing, lots of voices. And I thought, hmm. And he said, here we are. And I thought, uh-oh. He opens the door, and it's the rotary meeting. <laughs> and there's lots and lots and lots of people there. I've never been to, I, I have never been to a big meeting like that. And I just told you earlier that I don't like talking to big crowds. This is a really big crowd. And it turns out I was the guest speaker. There was a nice and a lectern and, and, a, and there was actually a topic. <laughs> and I wasn't prepared. <laughs> your heart racing. <laughs> Come to think of it, that's when my skip started. <laughs> and the topic was that Brody had purchased these AEDs, and they wanted to hear about defibrillation. So I was I was sitting there with these other folks, and they were trying to make polite conversation. I was trying to put together a talk in my head because I, in 10 minutes I was going to get up and give a little speech. And I remember, Dr. Milk, he probably doesn't remember this, but I remember, remember you sitting in the chair, you had your arms crossed, <laughs> and you had this smile on your face. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I was ever so nervous in my life, but I'm really proud that I got through it without fainting. So, so I, yeah, I, 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 learned my, I told my nurse, Kathy, never again. The answer is always going to be no. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a pacemaker that's wearing out, and it causes uh, tricuspid uh, regurgitation, if you get a new pacemaker, will that help? So the question change, change. Okay. The question is, uh, if you if you have a pacemaker and you have something called tricuspid regurgitation, if you change the pacemaker, will that take care of it? Is that did I guess get the question right? So the heart sits like this in the body. The pacemaker sits under the fat with a wire that goes into a vein, and all the veins drain into the heart. So we put a pacer in, we thread that wire with x-ray guidance down the vein, down this vein, across this valve called the tricuspid valve into the lower chamber. That lower wire sits in the lower part of the heart. That wire actually has to go through the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is a, 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 a big valve with a, three leaflets that opens and closes like this to, prevent, to, to keep the blood going in one direction. The tricuspid valve is a very big valve. It's, it's, it's redundant. There's, it's almost like three little parachutes that come together. And so that wire that goes across there sort of gets enveloped uh, in there. And usually it doesn't cause any trouble. But rarely that wire going across that valve can tether one of the leaflets so it doesn't close quite right. And as a result, the valve can leak. It may not close.
perfectly. And so that's tricuspid regurgitation means the tricuspid valve is leaking. Regurgitation is leaking. And if you have a wire across there and it's causing leaking, the good news is that in most people that leakage is so minimal that it doesn't cause much trouble. And we usually just leave it alone. But if the valve is leaking a lot and causing trouble, simply replacing the pacemaker isn't going to fix that because the problem isn't the pacemaker generator, it's the wire. So if a, pa a person has a pacemaker with a wire in the heart and the pacemaker battery has to be changed because it's due for a change, and if that wire is causing enough leakage that it's causing what we consider to be an issue, a problem, then the treatment is not only to replace the pacemaker, but to revise the lead. Very often that would require removing that wire and putting a new wire in and, and trying to position that wire in a little bit of a different place so it doesn't leak. Removing a pacemaker wire that's been in there for a long time is a lot harder than putting in the wire. What happens when you put a pacemaker wire in is the body, it heals into the body. So it actually scars into the vein, into the heart muscle, it's stuck. To get it out, very often, requires sophisticated tools, including lasers, to try and peel it off the heart. While Dr. Zhao and I might put in close to 500 devices a year, we only have to remove, we'd only have to remove maybe one or two a year, so neither of us get very good at it. So if the wires have to be removed, we generally send them to Madison or Milwaukee or Chicago or Mayo, a big center where they're, even at those big centers, all the doctors don't do them. They usually have a one go-to person that does the removal. So in the case of Madison, there's a Dr. Leal, very nice young guy. He, that's his thing, removing leads. So people all over the state send people to Dr. Leal. Or Dr. Kress in St. Louis in Milwaukee. He's really, that's his thing. He, he really loves removing leads. Um, and even they don't do it every day, but at least they do it on a more regular basis. We actually used to have a guy here, Dr. Suarez, that was a very good extractor. We used to have people send people to Appleton Memorial to have it done. Well, he, he retired. He didn't really share his knowledge with me or <laughs> with, with Dr. Zell. And so, so we never really picked up that particular skill. So to answer your question, if it's causing a leak and it's not a serious leak, because well, the tricuspid valve will accept a little bit of leakage. If it's just a little bit, you leave it alone. But if it's enough to cause trouble, the lead would have to be extracted in a whole new system. Is there a, a layer of leads? Yes, I, I, I have an example of that. Believe it or not, this is oh, a pacemaker. Wow. Oh, oh, yeah. So this is called the, uh, this is the, the micro. This is a Medtronic device. We don't put many of the, well, these, this is not something that's used so much yet because this is a very dumb pacemaker. <laughs> but what do you mean by that? <clears throat> well, this this pacemaker sits in the, in the right ventricle like this. So, in this heart model, you put it in from the groin, thread it up with a catheter through, and it sits right here in the lower chamber. Because it's 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 only in the lower chamber, it can't pace the upper part. It just paces the lower part. So it can't synchronize the top and the bottom together. <clears throat> it just paces the bottom. So it, it, let's say it paces the bottom at 70 beats a minute. What happens if the top part's going 80 beats a minute or 40 beats a minute? They won't be synchronized. So this little pacemaker isn't used that often. But it, may, it, it does have value in people, for example, um, who have a very slow heartbeat in the bottom and the top part's in fibrillation because you can't pace a fibrillating heart anyway. <laughs> And, and in particular, someone who's prone to infections, because if you have more hardware in the veins, or more prone to infections. So uh, I actually, again, unlike the lead extraction, we seldom do this, and so we send patients out for the micro. We send them to usually Madison and Milwaukee. And I guess in a typical year, I might send out one or two people, because most people benefit from the more sophisticated pacemaker, the smarter pacemaker.
components of medicine can cause tremor. Uh, but of course, many things can cause tremor. Uh, and sometimes, it, it, some, some, most side effects that it's related to medication it does go away. In the case of amiodarone, it may take a while because amiodarone takes several months to build up, as you probably know, and several months to get out of your system. Its half-life is about 30 days, and so it may take, if you've been on it for a while, it may take up five, six months to get out of your system. So if, if, if a person still has a tremor that long out, it's still possible it was from the medicine, but it's also, you'd also want to think about other things, because tremor can be caused by other things as well. If it is the medicine and hasn't gone away in five years, it probably is never going to go. If it's from the medicine. Well, that's it. Very, very often, if it is from the medicine, it would go away. So if it isn't, the doctor might be thinking, could you have something else? You'd think so. I'm not a neurologist, so I don't know. But, but uh, sometimes the body, the, your body may not have read the book. <laughs> I, I was always taught that, you know, when you're a student, you read a book, it's, it says you're supposed to have this, this, and this. but. You know, real patients don't always follow the book, um, and so, but yeah, if you, you know, again, your doctors might be looking for some other things if, if, if it hasn't gone away. Wrong guy to ask. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess I got age fifty two, but I don't. I do whatever I want to do. I mean, like my grandma. Like uh, there's a lot. There are a lot of people in have AFib where the top part's quivering. The bottom part's being irregular. So long as it's not too fast or too slow, and so long as you're out of proper blood thinner so there's no clots, you can live over 100 like that. Well, I didn't even know I had it until I went and had my colonoscopy because they had blood pressure in my body. That's how they picked it up. <laughs> and I came my heart back. The last time I looked into this, almost as many as 20 or 25 percent of people that they have minimal or no symptoms. So for that for that quarter of patients, we often take the more simple strategy that we talked about. For the three quarters of people that feel bad, we're stuck doing all the fancier treatments. But he put me on Plavix, and I was taking a baby aspirin because I had heart surgery in 2008. But uh, he said just keep taking that baby aspirin and that Plavix, which I had been on before I had heart surgery. But you get all black and blue. To, to, is that because you're taking too much of it? All blood thinners carry a risk of bleeding and bruising. That's, a, that's the downside of blood thinners. On the other hand, a stroke is pretty bad. But he didn't want to put me on a board. Yeah. He said, because then you're, he's a doctor here with you. Yeah, yeah. There, there are many different blood thinners. And um, we, as doctors, have to figure out what's the safest for the patient. There are some people, for example, with AFib, whose stroke risk is actually pretty low. And not everybody with AFib has the same stroke risk. I don't if even someone, know I got it. If someone has AFib, uh, I'll talk about, I, I might as well bring it up, because I think a lot of people have this question, how do we figure out the stroke risk? There's something called the CHADS BASC score. We give someone a score, the CHADS BASC score, and that tells us what the risk of a stroke would be if you have AFib. The things that go into the score are the age. By the way, a perfect CHADS BASC score is zero. So anything over zero is not good. So if you're over 65, you get one point. If you're over 75, you get two points. If, if you're a woman, if you're a woman, you get one point. Women have higher risk. If you have high blood pressure, hypertension, you get one point. If you have diabetes mellitus, you have one point. If you've ever had congestive heart failure, CHF, you get one point. If you have peripheral vascular disease, you get one point. Did I forget anything? Uh, I think that's most of them there. So if, if your score is two or higher, 
We recommend we recommend a blood thin. <laughs> if, your score, if your score is two, your risk of a stroke is about 2.1 percent per year. See, I've got a control ball, like you said, since I had heart surgery. Yeah. So I don't know your whole history, but most of us in the room are, you know, most of I think most everybody in the room is is, is, is close to that 65 or not, if not over. And, and, very, and, and high blood pressure, diabetes, very common. So a lot of people are going to be two or higher. For if your score is two or higher, we do recommend a blood thinner, a proper blood thinner. And that's drugs like Coumadin, Pradaxa, Eliquis, Xarelto. Now the kicker is that some people, their bleeding risk is high. In other words, there's some people where their bleeding risk is higher than the risk of the stroke. So if, if someone, for example, I have a patient who has had bleeds into her brain, all of a sudden she'll just have a bleed into her brain, her, a blood vessel will burst. Well, if she were in a blood thinner, it'd be even worse. So you don't want to put a woman like that on a blood thinner. So then you have to figure, well, gee, we can't do that. What can we do instead? So that's where we start doing things like, well, maybe a baby aspirin with or without clot. We, we, we try these other things. But if your bleeding risk is a normal risk and your score is two or higher, we recommend either Coumadin or one of the ones you see on TV, the Eliquis, the Relto, things like that. I don't know. I don't know. Coumadin is cheaper. <laughs> I'm wondering if um, the doctors from this group that perform the ablations, what hospital do they use? Well, they would be Dr. Zhao and me. Okay. <laughs> so the hospital we use right now is Appleton Memorial. In, in the valley here, Appleton Memorial is the only one that can do the complex ablation. There's some simple ablations that are being done right now in St. E. And I believe in mercy, but they don't do things like the eight good and more complicated things. So we, we, we right now uh, are doing all our ablations at Appleton Memorial. But very soon, I heard Dr. Zhao just got his privileges yesterday, uh, we'll be doing them at other hospitals as well. St. Elizabeth's, Mercy. But, but, right, but uh, right now, today, as of today, uh, it's still just Appleton Memorial. About the uh, ablations, how would you decide between our RF or our cryo ablation? That's a very good question. Both are both can be effective. Uh, a lot of it depends on what we're ablating. Uh, cryo ablation, freezing the spot, is more forgiving. Uh, most pediatric electrophysiologists working on babies and kids use freezing because freezing is more gentle. So, for example. Uh, one of the risks of an ablation, I think I drew this picture earlier about someone I ablated a couple weeks ago where they have an electrical connection. Sinus node up here, current goes through here, down here, and then down. And there's a little short circuit like this where the current would spin. So to do the ablation, took a catheter up here, cauterized this spot, and went away. You can see this spot is pretty close to this spot. If you burn or freeze this area and the person coughs or the wire moves or the heart's beating, if the wire just slips and then burns this one too, then you've got trouble. And no electricity can get from top to bottom. You went from having two pathways to none. Then you've got complete heart block. No current getting through. You'd have to put a pacemaker in there. And most people have an ablation don't want to leave them in the hospital with a pacemaker. Freezing is more forgiving. It takes, when, when we ablate this pathway with freezing, it takes almost four minutes for that area of freezing for it to die. So if you start to freeze and something happens, you can stop the freezing and still be okay. Radio frequency happens very quick. Usually five, 10 seconds, it's cooked. So, on the other hand, radio frequency is more durable. It's more likely to work because it's, it's really powerful. So, 
in some cases we choose cryo because it, it's too close to a delicate spot. But if it's not close, we usually use radio frequency. Kids, we don't take care of kids anymore. Uh, when I first came here, uh, there wasn't a pediatric electrophysiologist. And now there's a pediatrician around. We send all the kids to them. They pretty much always use cryo. Thank you. Thank you. The NAIDS procedure is a surgical procedure that's used for AFib. It, uh, it does, it's actually in many ways better than the catheter ablation because they do it with the chest either open or either down the middle or through the ribs. Someone like me doesn't do that, be a heart surgeon. The heart surgeon will go in and just like we do with the, with the catheter or wire isolating the bad areas, they do the same thing but with, with the chest open. And the, the success rate with that, it depends on who's doing it. It's very, very um, uh, surgeon dependent. And uh, it's kind of a big procedure to do as a standalone. It's very rare that we do the maze procedure standalone. If, you're, if you have nothing else wrong with your heart, we prefer using the catheters. Even with the minimally invasive, right now. If, if you have to have open heart surgery though for bypass, let's see, a bypass, a valve job, a plumbing job, while they're there, why not do the maze procedure? Because it's pretty, with the new technology now, it's a fairly easy add-on. It adds on, I think, about 20 minutes at most to the operation. So they can do it at the site. Right now, we don't really do it as a standalone. There are some places that are so good at it, though, that you know, if, if everything else, you might consider going to a big place to do standalone days. There, there are usually surgeons that specialize just in that, and there's no one around here that I know of that you know, does that. something like that and what that medicine does is it decreases the irritable spot so it doesn't hopefully doesn't fire as much not very powerful but it's very safe and inexpensive so it's something that many doctors will, will start with and if you get by with that whether it's taking a powerful drug that can make things worse It depends on what you're ablating. In general, yes. The left side is a little bit more complicated than the right. The left side of the heart's under high pressure. It then pumps blood through the rest, throughout the body. The right side of the heart pumps blood into the lungs, low pressure. So it's usually easier to get to. All the veins drain to the right side. So to get to the right side is a lot easier. When we, when we want to go to the left side of the heart, we go up the veins into the right side. And it's the longest needle you've ever seen. It's about this long. Yeah. Yeah. So you go up with a long needle and you punch a little hole across the wall to get from right to left. So that's called a transeptal. Um, it's a little bit more risky. And again, depending on what it is, it, um, you know, but it can be, it, it's, it's, not, it's not like hugely a lot more risky, but it's more risky. Couple more questions. Not a question. Compliment to you. I did an ablation on my mother at age 85. It was very successful. She lived to be 100 and a half. Thank you. <laughs> I like to hear nice things, although I think I heard some of you not doing that so well. So. Yeah. It depends. Depends. I mean, if you, some people have weakened hearts, have congested heart failure, do have very large hearts. Um, you always used to say about the size of your fist. So, 
I, I'm sorry, I don't have many props. I feel kind of bad. Like I said, I kind of didn't expect this many people, so I kind of expected a little thing, but I don't. But uh, as sure, sure. If you come to the clinic here for any reason, we can certainly show you on the computer. Yeah, no problem. One last question. Uh, how many procedures can you do here? Like, which ones do you do here? That's a very good question. Uh, in the case of devices that we implant, uh, we do um, pacers, defibrillators, we do all of those. Uh, we don't do the, at, at this point, the micro, that little little one that we talked about, mm -hmm. and we don't do the extractions. And partly because there's so little need to do it that we can't get really good at it. Dr. Zhao and I like to think that what we do, we do really, really, really well. But if we can't be like super good at it, we'll send people out. So in other words, you probably have to, well, we're, that's an EMC issue, just for heart surgery mostly now, if that's what somebody needed. Um, yeah, we do, yeah, I, we don't do the heart surgery. Uh, Parotia. Yeah, they do the heart surgery. We also do the pacers there right now. We don't do pacers here. The pacers and the defibrillators are all done at the hospital. We do all the different ablations, including AFib, flutter, all the different sorts of rhythms. There's some uh, ablations that we do in the left side, the left lower chamber, the left ventricle, that neither Dr. Zai and I have a huge experience with, so unless the person can leave, I've had occasionally patients say, Dr. Mariam, I want you to do it. I'm not gonna go to Madison, I'm not gonna go to Mall. They twist my arm, we, we do it, but there are some things that we prefer to send out, but very few things, to be quite honest. The main reason we send those two things out is there's such a low need for it that we can't get really good at it. And if you, can, if you only do two of something a year, it's hard to say you're an expert. You don't replace the valves here, do you? Uh, again, that's a plumbing question, not a electrical question. <laughs> but, but yeah, they do, they do replace valves at the here? hospital. Or at the hospital? Uh, yeah. At, at this heart institute, we don't do, the only surgery we do uh, here at this, at this clinic uh, electrical surgery we do is what's called the implanted loop recorder. It's a little thing which I can pass around. It's a little secret agent thing. We can actually put, we actually implant this. We just make a little cut and we slip it under your skin, put a couple stitches, and this monitors your heartbeat. So if someone has a, a rhythm, we're trying to figure out what's going on. It only happens once or twice a month. We can implant this so we can catch it. This is a minor surgical procedure, so we can do that right here. I know Dr. Uh, Tamlin, who's a vein specialist, does varicose veins upstairs as well. But almost all the surgery stuff is still going to be done at the hospital. Maybe someday we'll have be able to do more in, in this sort of a setting, but right now we don't. So your sister's got to have a bell for That has to be done at the hospital. By somebody from here, I don't know who's. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. They do replace valve. Val valve val val replacement anymore has gotten to be bread and butter for heart surgeons. That's that's pretty much routine for them. They do those types of things every week. One last question. Yes. I, I should I should be careful. I, I, I'm not an insurance specialist, but everything I've talked about, <laughs> none of it is experimental. So it's all there. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know all the different insurances, yeah. <coughs> all, everything I mentioned today is, is, is pretty standard therapy. None, none of it's experimental. They don't pay for experimental things. <coughs> well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>